on the afternoon of July 29, 1938. This man, Wasum Choi, an obscure but wealthy restaurateur from Jersey City, vanished aboard Pan American Airways Flight 229 in the South Pacific. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. On December 7th, 1941, Three hundred fifty-three Japanese warplanes left the decks of six aircraft carriers to destroy the American Navy at Pearl Harbor. While the attack on Pearl Harbor is well known, what led up to the vicious attack is lost in the dense fog of history. There was a secret war before the war. The life of Hua Sun Choi was deeply entwined with Wan Trip, the brash and powerful CEO of Pan American Airways. Choi and Trip never met each other, but their lives, each in their own way, explain how the United States and Japan prepared for the Second World War two decades before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Juan Tripp ruled the up-and-coming Pan American Airways with an iron grip. A Yale graduate, Tripp worked years to create a commercial air route that connected San Francisco with China, a seemingly impossible goal in the early 30s. His plan was to use the most advanced aircraft of the era, the China Clipper Flying. Then there is Hua Sun Choi, a middle-aged and wealthy Chinese immigrant who was nicknamed Watson by his friends. Choi owned a string of successful restaurants in Jersey City and Manhattan, two of which were called China Clipper in honor of Tripp's ocean-spanning flying boat. Choi's restaurants made him wealthy, but he used his fortune not so much for personal gain but to fuel his life's passion, to stop Japanese aggression in China. He made this bold move even if it meant losing his life standing in front of a Japanese firing squad on a remote, unknown Pacific island. Hua Sun Choi and Wan Trip were very different, but each in their own way worked to thwart Japan's Pacific expansion. Japan, for its part, would do anything to stop Choi and Trip, and in doing so, stop America's Pacific designs nearly a decade before Pearl Harbor. Now, to the beginning of our story, which opens 100 years before Japan's Pearl Harbor attack. It all began here, when the United States discovered guano on a multitude of small and distant Pacific atolls in the mid-19th century. Guano nothing more than bird droppings, was a highly effective fertilizer of the era for American farmers. These island discoveries and the demand for guano led to the Guano Act, which put 50 island atolls under American control. Then Guam and the Philippines, as spoils of the Spanish-American War, became American possessions. Finally, as the 19th century closed, America claimed Hawaii, Midway, and Wake. Japan also had designs in the Pacific. It expanded into the Pacific, taking possession of a myriad of islands in the Western Pacific. If all this were not enough to set off a Pacific conflict, a third player, Germany, 
also put its boot squarely in the Pacific by taking possession of Micronesia. Germany's Micronesian holdings were unacceptable to Great Britain. On the eve of World War I, Great Britain's Prime Minister, H. H. Asquith, who possessed the facility of working quickly, secretly devised a plan to neuter German Pacific power. Asquith went directly to Japan's Prime Minister, Okuma Shiganobu, the son of an army officer and fervent nationalist, to create an alliance. With barely a cannon fired, Japan took control of Germany's possessions. The plan seemed perfect, but only for a moment. Soon the West saw a critical flaw in Asquith's plan, a flaw that would haunt America and Europe for decades. Now Japan, an Asian nation, not America and not Europe, controlled vast stretches of the Pacific. This potential threat was not lost on the American Navy. In October 1917, Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels received a prophetic memo about Japan's Pacific expansion from Admiral Albert P. Niblack. It is not a question of fortifying but providing stepping stones and lines of communication which may, in case of war, turn out to be lines of operation which can be converted into such. Future generations will not thank us for our carelessness. Our future lies in the Pacific. By 1920, it was clear that something had to be done to curb Japan's voracious military growth. For months in the early 20s, Europe, the United States, and Japan fought their way through the thorny problem of Pacific military expansion at the Washington Naval Conference. Finally, on February 5, 1922, a bargain was struck that on first glance appeared to favor the United States. To avoid military escalation, the three powers agreed to end all Pacific military expansion, excluding only Pearl Harbor. One, to reduce the size of the British, Japanese, French, Italian, and American fleets. And the other, the Nine Power Treaty, which guaranteed the integrity of China. And incidentally, one of the powers signing this was Japan. This put Japan in check, but time revealed a fly in the ointment. This agreement meant that all American possessions west of Hawaii were effectively neutralized. While Japan was thwarted, its Pacific possessions were far closer to its homeland than America's, and so more strategically valuable to Japan. America also found itself in check. Once again, something had to be done to solidify American Western Pacific power. But how could this diplomatic blunder be turned around? How could America and Europe get the upper hand? The first attempt fell into the lap of General Billy Mitchell, who was sent on a covert mission to survey Japan's Micronesian holdings. A roguish character. Mitchell filed a report to the army based on his secret surveillance that was damning in every word, every comma, every period. Japan's total military strength is growing constantly. Sooner or later, the diplomatic means of handling these questions will fail. The recourse will be war. It is here, still decades before Pearl Harbor, where our story picks up a desperate, haunting speed with the question, how could the United States, bound by treaty limitations, defeat Japanese expansion? The answer came from an unlikely ally, commercial aviation, specifically from Juan Tripp. It is also here that the purpose of Hua Sun Choi's 1938 desperate mission to help save China from Japan originates. Chinese by birth, 
American by choice. Choi knew better than anyone that without America's help, China's future was hopeless. And Choi was willing to give his life to save his native land. But first, let's backtrack a few years to a very young Juan Tripp. Born in 1899, Tripp's family was of some wealth and military lineage. Tripp entered Yale and then became a World War I naval aviator. By 1925, at just 26, Tripp was on the edge of commercial aviation success with a group of wealthy Yale classmates who invested in Tripp's small and unimportant airline. Tripp's original board of directors was the who's who of the moneyed and powerful, including Averill Harriman, who had extensive financial holdings, and handsome, blue-eyed John Hay Whitney, who had massive financial stakes in banking. In these first years of the airline, Tripp discovered the single key to success that made him and Pan American world powers. Lucrative government mail subsidies. Government money changed everything. Now, not needing to rely solely on income from a skittish flying public, rewarding long-term government mail contracts made Pan Am profitable. And Tripp hired men who helped him create an airline of unmatched supremacy. First, he hired Edwin Music, a 20s barnstormer who had matured into a savvy, technically expert pilot who created Pan Am's aviation techniques and its professional code that lasted into the 1980s. In his best move, Tripp also hired Charles Lindbergh, fresh off his transatlantic solo, as Pan Am's technical advisor. So, with a moneyed and powerful board, and with the two greatest aviators of the 20th century. Pan Am Airways was ready to conquer the aeronautical world and, by default, save the nation from Japan. Could anything be more perfect? With the world in his sights and without informing his board, Tripp set out to build the greatest ocean-spanning aircraft of the era, Tripp first went to Russian immigrant and Connecticut aircraft manufacturer Igor Sikorsky, a devout Russian Orthodox, to build the four-engine monster and ocean-spanning flying boat, the S-42. But the honor of building the luxurious and even more powerful China Clipper series was given to the stout, no-nonsense Midwesterner, Glenn Martin. Martin's China Clipper series was designated the M-130, and were constructed at his massive factory in Baltimore. Tripp's China Clipper specs were daunting and an epic leap beyond any other aircraft of the era, even Sikorsky's S-42. Martin agreed to build Tripp's three transoceanic flying boats at a cost of $417,000 each, a fortune, but still a money-losing proposition for the adventurous Martin. As Martin was still in the design stage of the China Clipper, Sikorsky's S-42 was already in construction. While Tripp laid the groundwork for his Trans-Pacific Air Route from San Francisco to China, Japan was expanding its dominance in Asia with the invasion of Manchuria. All great alliances begin with a common goal. As Japan was on the edge of conquering China, the young Chinese nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek, needed a modern and speedy transport system to stem Japan's aggression. And at the same time, Juan Tripp needed internal Chinese routes to make his expensive Trans-Pacific route profitable. It was another perfect aligning of the stars. Chiang Kai-shek sold Juan Tripp a 45% stake in the China National Aviation Corporation, giving Tripp a monopoly of China's commercial skies. It was a match made in heaven. While Tripp went about the business of commercial aviation, 
Pacific military competition continued. By 1932, the United States Navy no longer just speculated about war with Japan, but in a confidential report number 104, it unabashedly predicted war. Relations between Japan and the United States have daily become more strained. The cross points of the two nations are China and the islands in the southern Pacific, the Philippines and Guam. Japan dares to do as she pleases without fear of the United States. War could have broken out sometime in the 30s, but for two factors. The worldwide depression thwarted nations from waging expensive wars. And American sentiment was strongly anti-interventionist and anti-war. Until 1933, Japan adhered to the Washington Naval Treaty, but as predicted a decade earlier when it withdrew from the League of Nations, Japan began an aggressive military buildup in Micronesia. To the Navy and to Franklin Roosevelt, it must have all seemed hopeless. The Navy had accomplished nothing and believed it had no future in the Pacific. In spite of the determination of this nation for peace, it has become clear that acts and policies of nations in other parts of the world have far-reaching effects not only upon their immediate neighbors, but also on us. I am thankful that I can tell you that our nation is at peace. While the Navy was effectively neutralized, Tripp, with absolute authority, decreed when and where Pan American spread its wings. And to the Navy's benefit, those wings would fly the Pacific and become the ruse for America to fortify the Pacific. Tripp succeeded through the most basic business tactics. He used power, and he knew how to make a deal, whether it was in Cuba, China, the State Department, or even in the White House. So, whether the Navy knew it or not, and thanks to Juan Tripp, all was not lost. The Navy did have a future in the Pacific. In the spring of 1934, the Navy finally discovered the ruse it desperately needed when Pan American began laying the foundation of trans-Pacific bases the Navy could not build. Tripp and the Navy were about to lock arms. And the relationship was so entwined, it was difficult to determine where the needs of one left off. And the other began. On a balmy May day in 1934, Juan Tripp gathered his board of directors at Pan Am's headquarters on the 59th floor of the Chrysler Building. Tripp bluntly surprised everyone with a simple declaration and far-reaching statement. Gentlemen, we are about to fly the Pacific. The impact of Tripp's decision resounded all the way to Washington, where the Navy was already busy calculating what a commercial air route to China would mean to Pacific military strategy. The answer was obvious. It meant nothing less than the beginning of American military air bases across the Pacific. And that meant America could finally and seriously fortify the Pacific. The rubber hit the road on October 3rd, when Tripp formally requested rights across the Pacific in a forceful three-page letter to the Secretary of the Navy, Claude Swanson. Explaining that Pan Am planned to fly through Hawaii, Midway, Wake, Guam, and the Philippines en route to China, Tripp enticed Swanson with the prospect of new settlements and communication facilities. As though this were not enough, Tripp, in a thinly veiled reference to war preparations, offered to return control of the bases to the Navy if it became necessary. Beyond giddy, the Navy responded favorably in just two days. Acting Chief of Naval Operations, J.K. Tausig, submitted his report about Pan Am. The operating personnel work harder and are further advanced in aerial navigation than the Navy. 
Pan American Airways have more planes for air navigation research, blind flying, and experimental work than the Navy. In just days, this plan reached the desk of Franklin Roosevelt, who in turn wrote to Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Would you please familiarize yourself with this situation relating to these islands and then speak to me? The development of commercial aviation as well as naval operations makes this whole subject of immediate importance. But if the grand ruse were to be successful, the bases had to be constructed in a way that kept the Navy out of the way. On December 13th, Under Secretary of State William Phillips distilled his conclusions and forwarded them to the Navy's Claude Swanson. I am of the opinion that were Wake Island placed under the control and jurisdiction of the Navy Department, there would very likely result in some adverse comment in Japan. Phillips suggested the Interior Department take control. But Roosevelt took a more aggressive tack and signed an executive order placing Wake under the control of the Navy, which in turn leased space at Pearl Harbor, Midway, Wake, and Guam to Pan American. The ruse came together at remarkable speed. A letter dated January 5, 1935, just ten months before the first Trans-Pacific flight, the Chief of Naval Operations detailed the importance of Pan American to the military. As these facilities and services will be essential at the outbreak of war, they should be established in the time of peace. But one trip was not the Navy's only Pacific co-conspirator. In March 1935, the Commerce Department opened a secret mission to survey the South Pacific on the Coast Guard cutter Itasca and concluded that Baker and Howland Islands were exactly what the military would also need. Not coincidentally, Howland Island was where Amelia Earhart was lost en route around the world on her ill-fated trip. Earhart, too was a Navy co-conspirator. Pan Am's island bases were strategically located, and the exact stepping stones Admiral Niblack asked for in 1917. While building Pan Am's home base at Alameda across from San Francisco was easy enough, the construction of the bases across the Pacific was daunting. There were the windy, remote sand dunes of Midway, the lonely, rat-infested coral atoll of Wake that needed sophisticated aeronautical villages built from the ground up. And Guam, surrounded by Japanese Micronesia, lay nearly 6,000 miles from San Francisco. Every island base needed to be an independent village unto itself, with clear, safe landing lagoons. And they needed tons and tons of equipment, fuel depots, powerhouses, communication centers, staff quarters, and a hotel and kitchen for passengers. All this fell to William Grouch, a former naval aviator who was completely trusted by Juan Tripp. Grouch set up shop and hired laborers at Pier 22 at San Francisco's Embarcadero. Groach commissioned the SS North Haven to transport building materials across the Pacific. Its manifest listed every conceivable item, totaling more than 108,000 things ranging from spark plugs to toilet bowls, from radio gear to cigarettes to windmills. In all, enough to finish existing facilities at Pearl, Guam, and Manila, and to build two complete villages from the ground up, and air bases on Midway and Wake. While Groch's team labored across the Pacific, Igor Sikorsky delivered the first S-42 flying boat to Pan Am for testing. A product of the collective minds of Sikorsky, Tripp, and Lindbergh, the S-42 was groundbreaking, making it, for the briefest moment, the best aircraft in the world. Still, The S-42 could not fly the long Pacific route with mail and passengers. One trip had to wait for Glenn Martin's three M-130s, the China, Hawaii, and Philippine clippers, which had the endurance to gobble up the vast, empty Pacific skies. While Pan Am went about its business, 
Military tensions surfaced when, on March 14, 1935, Japan's military openly objected to the Trans-Pacific Route. A Navy office spokesman observed that the distinction between commercial airports and those for naval and military use was not clear. The landing places sanction could be converted into naval air bases whenever necessary and would be a potential danger to Japan because of the proximity of Japan's mandated islands. While Pan Am's use of Pearl Harbor was not universally supported by the military or the government, on May 15, 1935, Admiral Ernest King had the last word. The requirements of Pan American Airways for a seaplane operating area are practically identical with the Navy requirements for an auxiliary operating area. These two developments should go hand in hand. But Japan would have none of it and launched a verbal attack. It hardly needs to be said that the opening of regular flights between America and China greatly affects Japan's strategic situation. If we view this effort in terms of the large sacrifice America has been and still is making for the success of the flight between San Francisco and Hawaii, it looks like the line has a military purpose. But Japan was also building commercial facilities in Micronesia that had military ramifications, violating the treaty. Here are the ruins of one of Nanyo Kohasta Kaisha's buildings, which, much like Pan Am, fronted for the Imperial Navy. In the mid-30s, Juan Tripp's Pan Am had quite simply lapped the American military in aircraft design. And Japan even lagged the U.S. military. On time, the Clipper, across the Pacific Ocean from the Orient. The ships that are making new history in man's conquest of the air and setting new records for dependability. These airliners are now in regular scheduled flights between Manila in the Philippine Islands and San Francisco, carrying passengers, mail, and freight. With stops at Honolulu, Midway, Wake, and Guam, they travel a third of the way around the world in 60 hours flying time. Such huge ships have to meet the severest kind of strains from wind and weather and heavy cargoes. The planning of this airplane called for new developments of structural engineering. For example, look at that wing spread. 130 feet from tip to tip, and those wings have to carry the entire load. Every bit of that 130 feet of metal had to contribute its share of strength and dependability. Many of Japan's aircraft designs of the 1930s were, in fact, licensed from American manufacturers. The Douglas DC-2, for example, and the Japanese Nakajima Douglas DC-2 were virtually identical. So, it was not surprising that Japan asked for design licenses for the S-42 and Martin 130. The U.S. Navy refused. So, what was Japan to do without American designs? How could Japan match the success of America's long-distance aviation? Those questions may have been answered when Wa Sun Choi's 1938 flight to China aboard the Hawaii Clipper ended mysteriously. Before Choi's flight, Japan's Kawanishi Aircraft Company designed and built its own long-range flying boat, the H-6K, called the Mavis. The Mavis was a carbon copy of Igor Sikorsky's S-42, no doubt made from photos and observations by Japanese nationals. But like Pan Am, Japan needed a larger, more powerful flying boat that could match the China Clipper. That flying boat would be called the Emily. The design sources of the next generation Emily may have evolved from one of Japan's most callous acts of the 30s, the act which may have led to Wa Sun Choi's death. On November 22, 1935, Seemingly in defiance of the approaching Pacific storm season, Juan Tripp chose that day to open the Trans-Pacific Line. America may have put war concerns aside that day, but Japan once again launched an editorial attack. This project can be regarded as military preparations in the guise of civilian enterprise. 
But this time, the protest didn't stop with just a newspaper editorial. On the morning of the inaugural flight, two Japanese nationals slipped aboard the China Clipper to sabotage its radio direction finder. By miscalibrating the direction finder, Edwin Music would become lost over the vast Pacific Ocean, a horrifying prospect. The pair was arrested by the FBI. Millions around the world tuned their radios to hear the spectacle of the China Clippers' inaugural flight. 125,000 lined San Francisco Bay to witness the giant flying boat's departure. Six days later, and after 63 hours, 24 minutes total flying time, the China Clipper splashed into Manila Bay. A few months after Music's inaugural flight to China, Japan once again tried to stop Pan Am with another act of sabotage. On the afternoon of January 5, 1936, as the China Clipper sailed through the narrow Alameda Channel, the flying boat lifted up and shuddered. When hauled out of the water, the Alameda crew found ten long slices in the hull that were caused by iron rods placed just below the channel's surface. The origin of the objects was never certain, but some believed that they had been placed there by those who had the most to gain by stopping the clippers, Japan. In mid-1936, President Roosevelt asked how the southern guano atolls could be brought into America's defense posture. The answer came in the form of one more ruse, Executive Order 7368, which assigned the guano atolls to the Interior Department. And it's here when Amelia Earhart steps up. By all objective standards, Earhart's round-the-world flight was foolish even dangerous. The South Pacific skies were uncharted, vast, and held unknown dangers. Howland, Earhart's planned mid-Pacific refueling stop, was a desert island. But with Earhart's pending southerly route, Earhart got full and enthusiastic backing from the government, just as did Pan Am. In all, she was backed with $5 million of Navy, Army, and Interior Department labor, supplies, and build-out. To date, the critical and prosperous city of Shanghai escaped Japanese aggression. But that changed a month after Earhart disappeared. At twilight, Japanese seaman Yozo Saito drove his officer, 2nd Lieutenant Isao Oyama, north along Monument Road. Chinese guards hailed Saito to stop. An argument ensued. Oyama was shot through the head. Saito beaten to death. Because of this incident, 9,000 Japanese blue jackets landed near Shanghai. Shortly afterwards, the aircraft batteries of the Idumo, a Japanese warship, cracked into action. The destruction of Shanghai ensued. Truckloads of bodies were hauled from town. Shanghai was a meat locker. Gutters awash with blood. Mangled bodies were draped grotesquely in storefronts, and pieces of torn flesh were ground into the pavement by the stampeding crowds. This is the horror that Hua Sun Choi flew into. But it was only a beginning. More, much more, was to come. While the Shanghai incident was meaningless to the average American, it was a disaster for one trip, as it jeopardized the internal China air routes and the profitability of the Trans-Pacific Clippers. Quickly, Tripp met with Assistant to the Secretary of State Stanley Hornbeck to explain that the invasion of Shanghai had ruined any hope that Pan Am would be profitable in China. Tripp also confided that the internal Chinese routes and aircraft 
had been commandeered by Chiang Kai-shek and were being used by his military. Trip went on. The company has kept all of this out of the newspapers, and we should keep it confidential for the time being. Just as Tripp started to leave, he told Hornbeck that Mr. Cadono, head of the Japanese economic mission, had asked him to use one of Pan Am's Pacific bases at Guam or Hawaii as a Japanese air terminal. Hornbeck thought a moment and told Tripp point blank, It's time that American business begin discouraging Japanese advances such as this. But for Tripp, there was more of the Pacific to tame than just the line to Hong Kong. He assigned Edwin Music to survey a route to Samoa. At dawn, January 12th, Music, fatigued by three weeks in the South Pacific, and his crew climbed aboard the Samoan Clipper, an S-42. As the Clipper lifted off, the number four engine developed an oil leak. Music headed back to Pago Pago, opened the fuel dump valves, which sprayed long plumes of gasoline. In an instant, the engine's exhaust flames exploded the vaporized fuel, <laughs> killing all aboard, including music. Meanwhile, Japan remained fixed on solving two problems, how to thwart Pan Am's trans-Pacific route and how to develop its own long-range flying boats. Stopping Pan Am at this late date was impossible, but making the flights seem dangerous was very possible. Japan's second concern was more problematic, how to build a beefy transoceanic flying boat like the China Clipper. In the coming months, Japan may have taken steps to secure the China Clipper's plans that were beyond anyone's comprehension. On July 23, 1938, at 3 p.m., Choi's life finally intersected with Juan Tripp's. Choi sat in Pan American's Alameda passenger room waiting for his flight to China aboard the Hawaii Clipper, a twin to the China Clipper. So why was this mild-mannered and wealthy restaurateur making the long and now dangerous flight to war-torn China? Why would Choi risk his life? Through a series of social events, mainly dinners called rice bowl parties, Choi raised the three million dollars that he carried aboard the Hawaii Clipper. Hua Sun Choi was on a mission to deliver much-needed financial aid to Chiang Kai-shek in total defiance of Japan. At 3 p.m., Captain Leo Terletsky, a Russian immigrant, sent the Hawaii Clipper skimming across the open waters of San Francisco Bay. As was routine for the first stop of the flight to China, Choi stayed at the luxurious Royal Hawaii Hotel in Waikiki. Then, in subsequent overnight stops, at the remote atolls of Midway and Wake. But at Guam, everything changed. In the dark of night, at 4 a.m., July 29, 1938, Choi was awakened for breakfast. While Choi ate, Terletsky read the weather report aloud. Scattered showers, chance of a thunderstorm near the Philippine coast. Visibility good, cloud tops at 8 to 10,000 feet. Looks like a good day. It would not be a good day. Because of a slight tropical depression near the Philippines, Terletsky, following a safety procedure music had instituted, flew slightly south of the usual route to avoid thunderstorms. Through the morning, the weather conformed to Pan Am's prediction. Every half hour, the radio man tapped out the Hawaii Clipper's precise position. At noon, the Clipper fired off this report. Flying in rough air, 9,100 feet. 
Last direction finder bearing from Manila, 101 degrees true. A moment passed. The Hawaii Clipper sent a quick follow-up message. Stand by for one minute before sending as I'm having trouble with rain static. But then nothing. Silence. Long. Continuing. Unending silence. The Hawaii Clipper vanished. To be clear, even today, all the facts surrounding the Hawaii Clipper's disappearance are not understood. Knowing the Hawaii Clipper's precise last position allowed the Navy to tightly canvas the Pacific for the Clipper. But nothing. For weeks, nothing. No oil slick. No debris. Nothing. What happened? No one knows for sure. There's legitimate speculation that the Hawaii Clipper may have been lost to catastrophic mechanical failure due to a thunderstorm. But that does not explain why no debris, no oil slick, nothing was ever found, even though the Navy knew the Clipper's exact last reported location. Just 400 miles southwest of the last report lay the island of Koror, the main base for Japanese interests in the Palau Island chain. How does Koror figure into all this? One theory advanced, logically enough, suggests that Japanese naval officers snuck aboard the clipper at Guam. They then hid in the rear storage compartment and hijacked the Hawaii clipper for two important and obvious reasons to stop Choi's funds, and to use the Hawaii Clipper as a template for its own design of its next-generation flying boat, the Emily, as it did with the Sikorsky S-42. In addition to Choi, 14 passengers and crew disappeared that stormy afternoon. Did the Hawaii Clipper knife into the sea, leaving no debris? Or did Japan execute Wa Sun Choi and 14 more before a firing squad at Koror? The official status of the Hawaii Clipper loss remains open. There are only two things known for certain. First, Wa Sun Choi, in brash defiance of Japan, was carrying millions to Chiang Kai shek that was never delivered. Second, no trace of the Hawaii Clipper was ever found. Japan had every reason to stop Choi and appropriate the much-valued design of the giant Martin flying boat by hijacking it. In a very real way, the loss of the Hawaii Clipper ended the romance of flying the Pacific. Choi's desperate gambit to help China cost him his life and takes us to the end of our story when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. In the 20s, 30s, and early 40s, no one could imagine the stealthy death and destruction that could rain from the decks of an aircraft carrier. So, in the end, Pan Am's island bases were useless to the Navy on December 7th. It's not that Japan overlooked Pan Am's bases on December 7th. Far from it. During the attack, all of Pan Am's Pacific bases suffered heavy losses. The Philippine Clipper was riddled with machine gun fire at wake. The new Hong Kong Clipper was destroyed by Japanese bombs at Hong Kong. Canton and Howland Islands were bombed. Nine Pan American personnel were killed, 81 captured, and millions of dollars of equipment were destroyed or captured as predicted for decades prior to 1941. The initial battlefront followed Pan Am's Trans-Pacific Line, from Honolulu to Manila, by way of Midway, Wake, and Guam. They all fell to the Japanese shortly after December 7th, and the pivotal battle of the Pacific War raged around Midway in the spring of 1942. History clearly tells us how the attack on Pearl Harbor changed the world. 
and this story is how Pan Am changed America's direction in the years leading up to Pearl Harbor. To this day, how Wa Sun Choi lost his life and the millions he carried with him remains an open question. This documentary is based on the book China Clipper by Ronald Jackson. For more information and documentation about the China Clipper, Pan American, and Wa Sun Choi, the book is available at Amazon. Thank you.